night? No. Well, yeah, because it was day classes. Okay. Yeah. So they were running people around the clock yes. to yes. get enough people. And the expectation is you're going to be not just sort of engineer types and repairmen. You are going to be flying. No, or, we or, were going to be maintenance men yeah. at the start. Right. Yeah, we are going to be maintenance men. And right. that's, that's how, uh, that's what it says on the MOS. Yeah. You know. Okay. So you're not supposed to be air crew at that point? No. Oh. Although they did have crewmen who, they had flight engineers. Every, every one of these were a crewman. Yeah. Yeah. Every one was a crewman. Mm -hmm. But that's how you get your start. Right. So you start on the ground and then eventually you start flying. Yeah, that's okay. correct. All right. Uh, so while you're there and you're training all that time, uh, do you get to go up in the helicopters much? Oh, yes, yes, a lot of time. Okay. Learn how to lift, you know, hook up, lift. There's guys underneath you, and you start learning the, the language that you have to know as a flight engineer. Mm -hmm. Because once the load goes over the top of the pilot, you're, you're in control. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to bring her forward 15, right five, down five, you know, yeah. hold you forward, down five, down five more, you know, hold, hold you know, and they can, and a pilot. I mean, it's remarkable what they can do. It's remarkable. But we had a lot of warrant officers that were excellent, mm -hmm. excellent. And I mean, you you put your life in their hands, and they put their life in your hands. So, so. all right. So you and as so so basically, as training goes, you you had a pretty good deal. I thought so. Yeah. All right. Nineteen weeks of that. So yeah. when do you finish that? Was it kind of like December? Be or? Yes, yes, in December, in December. And then after that, I got to go home for 30 days, mm -hmm. 30 days. All right. And then from there, it's Vietnam. Vietnam. Okay. Yeah. How did they get you to Vietnam? Sent me right back to Washington. Okay. They okay. shipped Port me Lewis, out of yeah. Washington yeah. to Japan, I think we, or Alaska. Probably Alaska first, up, yeah. yeah. Then Japan, and then right to Cameron Bay. Okay. And what's your first impression of Vietnam when you get there? You can't believe it, you know. It's, it's, the humidity is so much, and it smells. Mm -hmm. It smells. It smells. So you know, you go. Huh. I I don't know if I'm gonna like this, you know. Yeah. All right. Um, now, is that a smell that you've ever had anywhere else? Well, I tell you what, I have a good smeller, mm -hmm. and I could smell the gooks before I'd see them. I could, I could smell them. I mean, I, you know, if, if Mama San was in your hooch, I could tell you Mama San was in the hooch, because I could smell them, you know. And I, uh, I already took a, like a, uh, what did I do? I had an interview at the VA, mm -hmm. and he says, is anything bothering you? And I says, well, I can be in a grocery store yet. Vietnamese in the next, next row. I can smell them, you know. I know they're there, you know. So, well, that lady stays says, with you. lady says, are you okay? Yeah, yeah I'm okay. I'm okay. That, but that particular memory comes back. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. So you, you land, then once you get off the plane, what do they do with you? Well, they, they took you to this other camp for this training, jungle training, they called it, you know. Well, all you did was sit in bunkers all night long for I don't know how many days. I, and then they uh, then you got your orders. Okay. And I was going up north to Phu Bai, mm -hmm. up on the DMZ. Mm -hmm. Well, where the hell is Phu Bai? You know, I don't know. But I knew I was going to Chinook helicopters. Right. So okay. my other buddy, my other buddy that was up there, he was in Hueys, mm -hmm. and then he had to go to Chinooks. You know, mm -hmm. but. Yeah. All right. So, what unit were you assigned to? Uh, the hundred, the one fifty ninth Aviation, hundred and first Airborne. Right. A company. Mm -hmm. A company, which meant that there was an A company and a B company in your unit. Mm -hmm. You had sixteen helicopters, eight and eight. Mm -hmm. So that's how that worked. But then, like I said, there was another company B which was a late way from us, mm -hmm. and another company, C, which they had 16 helicopters and 16 helicopters. So, you know, but you you didn't have time, you didn't mingle with nobody. You didn't, 
you know, the only buddy that was your family were the people in your hooch. Right. Your gunners, your gunners, and your flight engineers, and your crew chiefs. Okay. Have, so, so the pilots, the pilots are officers or warrant officers, they are separate from you. They please. have their own barracks and everything like that. You know, we heard that, you know, you're going to have to sleep outside and everything. Shit, when we got there, it, I thought it was really nice, you know. Okay, so um, do they, once you join the, your unit, uh, do, does anybody explain to you what's going on, or, you just, or do you just go to work? Well, we landed up at the airport up in Way, mm -hmm. and this guy picked us up. His name was Littleton. Well, welcome, you know. You were going foo by, you know. Yeah, where the hell foo by? He says, that's us out there. Sand beach, just all white sand, and there it is, 16 helicopters and a big big hangar and everything like that, and down we went there. Dropped us off at the first sergeants. It was Don Carlson and myself. We went through basic together, we went through AIT together, and here we are together in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And we come in front of the first sergeant, and he says, welcome, he said. I'm looking for two cooks. We're both v PFCs. Mm -hmm. He said, I'll put four on your shoulder if you become a cook. My buddy, put the four on, he says. He became a cook. Okay, and when you're talking four, as in, as in specialist fourth class? Yeah, or? specialist fourth class. Okay. We were PFCs, yeah. three, threes, you know. Yeah. And I said, no, sir, I said, I want to I wanna get in the flight platoon. He said, okay, you know, mm -hmm. didn't offer me four, mm -hmm. you know. But anyway, then uh, he was a cook, and then I went into maintenance. Right. And uh, I was in a different hooch at that time from the flight platoon, because mm -hmm. I was maintenance. And I got in maintenance and started doing my thing, and right away this, this helicopter caught my eye. It was off the side of the path, down, sitting there. Beautiful helicopter, 541. So this, this captain, this Captain Reeves, I said, what's the matter with that helicopter? He said, it was over torqued. He says, it needs new flight boxes. He and I said, well, that's kind of a project that I'd kind of like to take on. He goes, what? I says, that's a kind of a project I'd like to take on, you know. You know, else it was changing oils and shit yeah, like yeah. that, you know. And I, I thought I was pretty too good for that, really. Mm -hmm. I thought, you know, God damn it, he'd come over here to fix these helicopters, you know. So then about five days later, a Chinook crashed down south. He calls me up and we take about six, seven guys, another Chinook, and go down there and take them boxes out of the Chinook. Mm -hmm. And uh, we come back and the flight engineer that owned the ship, his name was Dan Osborne, and he was a six at that time, and I'm still a PFC, mm -hmm. you know. So we put this these boxes in, and he always kept coming out and watching us, you know, and and all these guys, uh, uh, what are they called? Techs. Mm -hmm. They're called techs, you know. They're all sevens and eights, mm -hmm. you know, and they they watched, you know, when we put this in because I mean it's unbelievable the technology that's in there, all the hydraulics going up and everything, and uh, we got those boxes together, and he said, here's the bolts. He said, now I want you to hook those up there. So I hooked them up there, and I got a couple wrenches. <laughs> I tightened them up, and then he comes the next day, he says, hey, Pouts, he says, what did you torque them at? He says, Armstrong. Mm -hmm. He says, you can't do that. So he took them all off again. Then we had to wait a couple of days for the more screw bolts, these special bolts, you know. Mm -hmm. And there's, it's in the heater closet, and they, they keep going up. They're hy hydraulics, which tilt the blades and all this. So it goes in there, and I put it together, and then I said to him, well, now you tighten them up, you know, because mm -hmm. it was the foot pressure on it was only, you know, hand tight, you know. So here he comes out with a little torque wrench about this long. We never seen a yeah. torque wrench in Vietnam, you know. Jesus, shapers. And he torqued them, and then 
He said, well, the next day we're going to go, we're going to go out and fly it, you know. Hey, man, you know, get it up and it starts up and we go out and they, they take it off the ground about a foot, you know, so if it crashes, you know, ain't going to get hurt, you know. And here we are hovering around and all of a sudden here we are at 100 feet and then we're at 1,000 feet, you know, going, whoa, God damn, this is, this is great, you know. And then we landed and he says, well, tomorrow it's going online, you know. He says, I'm going to send Osborne with you. He says, but the ship is yours. Here I'm a flight engineer. Mm -hmm. You know, I go, well, hell, I said, I don't know anything. So this Osborne, he was, he was a smart ass. He was really a smart ass. He always was in the NCO club and everything, getting drunk every night. He took me out and started teaching me about, you know, the techniques of mm -hmm. how to talk to the pilots. Right. That's the most important thing that you have to know. And, and you train how to train your guys, you know, because you got to, the left guy is your gunner, right, is your crew chief. And every time you dump a load, they have to be out the windows looking so you don't not hitting trees or anything like mm -hmm. that when you're going up, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's left side clear, right side clear, clear in the rear, ready to roll, you know. Boom, away you go. Go get another load. Go back again. Every fire base in it. It was just continuous. That's all we did all day. Got strapped stuff and... All right. So you're based out of Fubai. Uh, how far would you fly? I mean, how, how long were the missions? Oh, so, sometimes long, sometimes short. Okay. If you if you see the maps of a ripcord, you know, you know that's kind of straight out. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's Cambodian border. Yeah, or okay. Laos probably. Yeah. Laos, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're right out in front of you. And as the Ashall Valley came by, and uh, that was almost for the first stout, you know. How, how long would it take to get out there? And how long would the helicopter ride be? Oh, I, that, that I cannot really tell you exactly. I really can't because, you know, time just kept flying by. But, uh, you know, we had to go to uh, camp. Evans mm -hmm. and Eagle to get fuel all the yeah, time. Yeah. And you'd put on what, 600 gallons of fuel all the time? And you were doing that continuously. Mm -hmm. But it just depends what you're hauling. Yeah. Because you never topped off the tanks. Because whatever fuel you put in hurt you on your loads. Mm -hmm. So that's, that was weird. All right. So um, typically, how many missions would you fly in a day? Endless. Endless. Well, so Endless. We, and our biggest concern was that we would come in after 6 o'clock, we never could get any food. That was our biggest concern. Because we'd come in in the evening and they'd already have the, the chow line shut down. That was our biggest bitching. And what, once we went to the top man, that changed in a hurry. Good. You know. But with my buddy, Don Carlson, being a cook, I bought a refrigerator and he'd stick a steak in there and then I had a fan. The three things you needed in Vietnam to survive was a frying pan, a fan, and a refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And he always kept putting a steak in there and then I'd get in and I'd fry a steak. So I had it, I had it pretty well made, but then I was stupid enough to talk him into coming, for, coming over flying with us. Oh. Yeah. So he put in about five, six months as a cook, and he transferred into the flight. And when we ended up in December, he had his own ship also. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Now, you're there basically for a year. So how quickly did you start flying? When did you? Well, I would say I must have spent like two months in, in, in repairs. Okay. So and January, then, February, you're, mm -hmm. you're still on the ground. Yep, yep, yep. And then when, and then is that, at the end of that time, is that when you fixed up your own ship? Yep, yeah, okay. by the time we got it fixed, put together, back together, and then it became mine. So the rest of the tour is yours, okay. Now, uh, so you're basically flying pretty much th through most of the year then. Yes. And it's the first couple of years you missed. So, um, were there, was the weather different at different times of year? Continuously, continuous, the monsoons, mm -hmm. you know, you don't fly very much in the monsoons. But the deal is, you get out there in the mountains, 
and uh, what should I say? The cloud cover was so bad. A, a pilot landed me on a fire base one time. There was no fire base, and we got shot to shit. And I lost my load on the fire base, and everything had to have a cobra come in and destroy the, the load. Mm -hmm. And I was too nice a guy. I should have when I when we landed. I should, probably should have beat him to death, because we're, you know he's on radar. I'm I'm sitting in a hole, you know. But but that's that was one of the times that. You know, but you never heard anything like that. You know, it, mm -hmm. it never got back to people where the pilots would screw up. You know, so. Okay. Now, was it rare for someone to screw up like that? I'm sure it was often, 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 because because you hear of all kinds of things that you know, where the loads got to the wrong fire bases mm -hmm. and everything like that. Bringing one five five howitzers out to a fire base with only one o fives on it, see, mm -hmm. you know, so things like that. But then you, then they just turn around and you come and get a, that load off of there and take it to another one. So mm -hmm. now the pilots who made the mistakes, did they ever get replaced? Or? No, no. no. Just... But the deal is, once you once you got a reputation in flight, you always got good pilots mm -hmm. and good warrant officers. You know, I just got that. I don't know how it worked out, but they, this Captain Fry, this Captain Fry, which was a lifer, mm -hmm. and uh, he asked me one day. He says, "Hey, Chief," he said, "Now if we're going in, and I get shot up." He says, "Can you, can you get us home?" I says, "I'll get you home," but I said, "I'll crash on the way coming in." I mm -hmm. says, "I can't land it. I can't take off." I said, I can fly it straight, mm -hmm. because they used to always, well, if, a, if a pilot has to take a piss or something, mm -hmm. you got a replacement. That was the chief, you know, he'd get, I'd get behind the, you know, the co-pilot, you know, he'd go out the back and take a pee, you know, and I'm flying it, and then, then they, they'd always give you that, give you the stick, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, it was a, you know, a captain in there, he'd say, okay, take her over, you know, and you'd have the thrust and the whatever. Now, did they usually have a pilot and a co-pilot? Yep. Okay. Two two pilots all the time. Okay. So but so you you were just the extra guy. No, I I not an extra guy. I'm the most important guy. The ship belongs to me. Well, yeah, no, but I meant in terms of actually flying the thing. Yes. Yeah, you're you're, you're, you're there. Emergency backup. Emergency backup. The next day after we talked, we were for some reason we weren't flying, and he came and called me out to my ship. And we went flying for eight hours. I don't know how many times I landed that ship and how many times I took off, but it was continuously. Mm -hmm. And we'd be flying along, and he'd say, Chief, we are in what you call a crash dive. And I'd go, well, What do you mean? He said, Look at your, your wings. I'd have them straight down, you know, like this. He says, Keep them, watch that there. He says, he says, you would look outside all the time. I'm flying along and I'm watching it. And he says, you can't do that. He says, you've got to watch the the wings, mm -hmm. you know. So, you know, that's how in a day, in a day, I could really wheel, you know, make turns, you know, all day, you know, with your feet and psh, psh, with the thrust lever, you know, when you go up you forward and then pull the thrust up and you bring her up like this and away you go, you know. Okay. And he was, he was proud. He was proud to have me. And, and he flew a lot with us. I mean, and the warrant officers, too, you had really high class warrant officers, and they knew that if you go out and you get in trouble, we're going to come home. You know, mm -hmm. that was the main thing. Okay. So, would you uh, have different. So, you were always pretty much on this, the same helicopter, right? Only one. Yeah, you just had your one. But the pilots would rotate. Yes. Okay. Yes, every day. And did the pilots kind of, did they get, the more senior ones, did they get to pick who they flew with? I think so. Yeah. I really think so. I really think so. I think they did. So you had some guys that you worked with regularly then? Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. You know, and then, if you'd see these warrant officers walking down the deal, you know, you'd give them a salute, and then they'd always say, would you cut that <laughs> shit off, you know, because it was always a deal. If there was a sniper watching, and you salute yeah. somebody, they'd shoot the other guy, you know. It was always a joke, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you're walking down to the mess hall or something, you know, 
You didn't salute nobody, you know, but you would do it just for the hell of it. You know? Yeah. Now, did the warrant officers act differently from oh, the yes. regular officers? Oh, way different. Way different. They would come and drink beer with you in your hooch and, you know, they were just normal people. That was wonderful. But, you know, the lifers, they had the, you know, they had the, had to show respect, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we never, never, did never show them disrespect. Yeah. You know, but, you, you know, you've got your assholes in any unit or something like that. Mm -hmm. There was people getting thrown in the brigs for stupidity and stuff like that, but flight platoon, you're, you're, you're your own company, mm -hmm. you know. Nobody comes, nobody comes in your hooch. Mm -hmm. Nobody comes in your hooch. If you don't belong there, you don't, don't come in. Unless you're invited. That's right. Yeah. All right. Now, the, uh... You know, there's lot, there are lots of stories about life in, in, in camps in Vietnam and stuff like that. And one of them is a lot of people were using drugs and that sort of thing. Uh, does that happen in a flight unit or is that... Yes, a, yes know? it does. It does. It's... It, what you had to watch out for the most, especially in maintenance, that it got classified as heads and juicers. Mm -hmm. That's how the, a company gets classified. Yeah. Heads and juicers, and the flight platoons were juicers. Not the not the second platoon; mm -hmm. they were known as heads. So you know that's how it, that's how they were classified. Mm -hmm. You know, but the first flight, they were pretty strict people, pretty strict people. So you drink beer at night, or when you're off beer, wine, but... whiskey, anything that we could get our hands on, and being a being. A flight engineer, you still got your card, but you couldn't buy the booze. Mm -hmm. But when you went down to Da Nang, you just handed it to the pilot. He always bought you five bottles. Mm -hmm. You know, Kessler's at a dollar ten cents a fifth. It was was oh, okay. Uh, now, was there more of a problem if the people were you know smoking pot or whatever? Did that affect them in terms of how they performed their job? Well, you knew, you knew pretty well. See, when they would pull maintenance on your ship, mm -hmm. you already knew, you know, you'd see who was there and you would be right behind them. You know, you never trusted anybody okay. because they had a person, who, the mechanic Murphy killed more people than anybody else. And Murphy was the guy who fucked up. You know, and was high or whatever, and didn't know what he was doing. And you'd fly away and explode in midair. Murphy got you. you see? that was it. Murphy was the guy's name. You know, so it was. And you, you, you just knew the people, mm -hmm. who to trust and who not to trust. Yeah. But there was a lot of it going on, mm -hmm. a lot of it going on, because Mama San would bring it in, and it was it was cheap and everything like that. Uh, and then would you, you, would you be able to go off the base a lot or? Not it? when you were a flight platoon. Yeah. No. Cooks and mechanics and everything like that, they, I think I was to a PX maybe three times mm -hmm. in a year. Else I was always on flight. And I had, I, uh, at the end of my flight, I was come, going into a major. And that means when they got changed the big components on your helicopter and that, and then my my days start slowing down. Mm -hmm. And then I I got good jobs like going down to Nang, picking up beer for the PXs and stuff like that, short runs and that because they didn't want to major my helicopter. Mm -hmm. So that's how, you know, at the end. So I got I had pretty good. Okay, all right. Now uh, you mentioned you you. You went to basically pretty much all the fire bases all around that area. About I would say so. Yeah. And on that slip, there was fire bases that some names that I think were gone before I got there and came after I left. Mm -hmm. You know, but talking to a uh, talking to one of our friends on first flight there, and uh, he stayed. He re-upped. Mm -hmm. And we left, we left Brock Miller, 
left in November, and I left in December. In the following, de following December, Fubai wasn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they we were, we were pulling out and dismantling all this. They were running. They were run over. They were run. You know, well, that that's true because in 1972, when the North Vietnamese invaded, coming down, they went. Yeah, they got all the way Camp down. Camp Evans, and they came all the way down. Yeah, they got they got almost into Way before they were stopped. And Fubai is outside of Way, so yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you believe that? I mean, but. Uh, my friend Brock Miller there, he talks to a lot of people and they said it, it, it was just unbelievable what happened, you know. And I said, I'm glad I was home. Yeah, I'm glad. Now, uh, of course, we're here at a, a Ripcord reunion. Ripcord is one of the many bases you went to. Now, yeah. what do you remember about flying to Ripcord? What do I remember? Yeah. Putting it up there. <clears throat> okay. Putting it up there. I, I brought, I know that I put that that quad 50s, that quad 50 up there that's sitting on there, I know I put that on that still, you know, mm -hmm. and I know I hauled a 105 out there because I couldn't haul a 155, and there was 105s and 155s yeah, out right. there, but they had to be brought in by a hook, you know, so a heavier one. A sky crane kind of yeah. thing? Yeah. So, but ammunition, 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 and I said, you know, and the guy said to me here at there, I said, you know, you remember, you guys used to always give us the finger coming in, coming in, because any shelter half or anything, we ripped, you know, it was flying in the air, the sandbags were flying in right. the air that they wouldn't fall, and everybody was pissed off. And I said, but remember, when you were out of ammunition and they're coming up that hill, here you were, yeah. bring her in, bring her uh, yeah. in, you know, and here we're getting bullet holes all over, and yet you wanted to, you come on in, you know. Okay. And I told these guys, he says, no, I don't remember Chief ever guys giving you the finger. And I said, I was number one on a lot of fire bases, you know, because we ripped everything apart sure. when we came in. So the wash from the rotor is Yeah, the rotor wash was so tremendous, you know. Okay. Now, there were three attempts to set up Ripcord. And there was one in the middle of March, and there was one on the first of April, and then there was the main. The, then the middle of April is when they actually finally established the base. Now, did you fly in the earlier tries? Do you know? No. Okay. No, I don't. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. But uh, yeah, because they didn't bring a lot of heavy loads in those first two times because they they abandoned too quickly. So, but it's when they're bringing in the uh, the artillery and they're bringing in all the other equipment and, no. and, and the quad fifty. Like okay. like he said that. Once, when we pulled, you know, who knew we were? And I tell you what, people say that, you know, that we pulled everything off there. We didn't pull shit off there. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. We pulled the men off there, and we pulled whatever they could carry on there. And people say, oh, you carry netfuls and netfuls and netfuls. I think them guns were standing straight up and down when we, when we pulled out. Because once we got about five miles away, them B-52 bombers hit right. that place and it rumbled. Yeah. Well, the 105 howitzer battery had been basically destroyed. Those guns were probably still there. I believe that. But, I mean, I've interviewed enough people to have people who, talk, who were artillerists and, and, and most of the, the 155s mostly got out. Got out, see. And I've talked to people who were setting up the sling loads and having them taken out. So, so they took stuff out. Yeah. And then, you know, I heard some guys say, well, we slung load them 105s out. That's not true. You didn't swing load no 105 out. That was picked up by a Dale. You know, we came right on top of them. They were on the barrel, and they'd hit us in the way we went yeah. with you. Know. Yeah. No, the 105s, I think they left, because they were, they were just basically destroyed anyway. So, you know, but everything, you know, after it blew up, everything was destroyed. Yeah. You know. They spent time digging guys out because they were underground, you know. Once our ship exploded, once it caught fire and exploded, you know, everything was... But, you know, they said it was 15,000 in the air around us, you know. Mm -hmm. And they saw this was a chance of doing it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So, um, you're, you're basically, you're, you're flying back and forth in the period, whole period when Ripcord was going on. Now, did it get harder to get into Ripcord over time? Well, well, yes, yes, but getting there was no problem because we came down a river all the time, and 
we knock sand pans over with loads and stuff like that, just for joking, you know. We, but we always had Cobras on our right and left, mm -hmm. and we'd be flying, and then the Cobras guy would talk to uh, talk to me. I'd be the chief, and he'd say, Chief, if you want the gun cover, you tell them guys to slow up because we can't keep up. Like a Cobra could do probably 200 knots on a dive. Mm -hmm and we could fly maybe 180 flat out, but they can't fl flat out, they can't fly 180 knots. Okay. So they were, we were losing our gun cover all the time. So you'd have to tell the pilot, you know, hey, sir, would you please slow her up? You know, and the Cobras, we're losing our Cobra coverage. But we'd go right down that creek, just, uh, well, it was a river, I think, you know. But then when we radio, we're coming up, you know, and they would open up, all over, out in the jungle. Just mm -hmm. open up everything they had, we come up and drop it, mm -hmm. and just go right back down over the hill. And that's how we survived, see. Okay, now would you would you land on ripcord? Or would no, you just, no, just never just hover, land. hover above and then just hover, hover up and just drop the deal, drop your, drop your load. No, never, no, not me. Okay. Not me, but they're probably, you know, You know, you don't really know. But they said there was 13 helicopters shot down up there on Ripcord. Um, you know, over the course of the campaign, there probably were. Yeah, yeah. But so, they, they weren't all Chinooks, though. They were Hueys and. Yeah, but there was a lot of Chinooks. There were there. Chinooks. There were definitely Chinooks. Because yes. I took a front rotor blade off there, mm -hmm. dropped over the mountain, taking it back to base, and a pilot said to me, "He said, Chief, how's that rotor doing?" And I looked in the hole, and it was gone. Turned around like this, there it was behind my helicopter, flying by itself. Oh. And I said, I said, dropping the load. And I shot the load off. And that flew by itself, it went over the top of our helicopter, and the straps hit our blades. Wow. Hit our blades and started going back to the fire base. And I said, somebody better call, God damn it, that, that thing's going back to the fire base. You know, we weren't that far away yet, mm -hmm. but it never made it back to the fire base. Mm -hmm. And we flew to an opening or wherever it was, I don't remember how, what direction or whatever, and that pilot, he, it was a warrant officer, he stopped. He came off my ship, he shit right by my back tire, and he said, Chief, scared the shit out of me. <laughs> he told me right off. And this Brock Miller, he's been coming to these reunions. He says, you know, Pout, somebody claimed to be you. And I said, no, there's there's only one guy who lost, who lost a, a rotor blade mm -hmm. going back to the deal. And I said, that was me. I said, mm -hmm. and of course, you know, I said, I got my crew to, you know, still confirm it. The two guys that were with me are still alive to this day, you know. But... Yeah, I had I had gunners that you'd be down in the club. Ten thirty, your orders always came out where you're going the next morning. And we had this little gunner, and he'd come back and he'd say, "I'll tap two doubles. I'm going with that goddamn bouts again tomorrow." He says, <laughs> "We're going to get shot up sure as a goddamn day long." And every time he'd come on there, we'd take rounds. Every time. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever actually get shot down? No. No, never got shot down and never got close to being shot down. Lots of holes. Yeah. Uh, field limits. Uh, for me, the, the, what should I say, the maintenance <coughs> men, they were pissed off at me a lot because it was always blivets because mm -hmm. they always shot you in the fuel tanks. You know. Now describe, a lot of people won't even know what a blivet is. So. A blivet, it's where the fuel goes in on the side of your, side of your ship and and on a Chinook, you know, they're out, you know, like the pregnant on the side. Yeah. And you just take that and you drop that down there, and the fuel blivets are inside there. Mm -hmm. And they have a compound on it. If you shoot through there, it doesn't leak out. Mm -hmm. It seals it up right, right away. But you cannot leave that in there. Yeah. Because that bullet's flying around there, and all of a sudden it gets in your fuel line, sure. and you're done. You know, sure, you, you know. You can be flying along and you don't need two engines. Mm -hmm. See, the, 
The Chinook is set up as dual systems for everything except the drive shaft. Mm -hmm. And the drive shaft, if they get you there, there's no hope, you know. So, so, but they they really didn't shoot at the drive shafts, mm -hmm. you know. They, that wasn't their big deal. And when you're laying in the hole, when you're laying in the hole, we always had armor plating, not armor plating, but your uh, like your flak vest. Yeah. We had them laying three, three, and they're always cut. You know, there was so they go around you like this. So you'd lay three in the hole. Mm -hmm. They always knew where you were. See, the gooks knew where you were. And they wanted to shoot you in your balls, you know. That's where they'd always shoot, you know, right there. They wouldn't shoot at your face. They always shot, you know, oh, we're going to get him, you know. So when you're flying on one of these missions, so where are you inside the helicopter in terms of Ninety percent of the time laying right in that hole. Okay. Right in the middle of right in the middle of the hill. So right in the middle, and that's directly above where the cargo is, is loaded in the sling load, or yeah. you know, are you looking down and you can see the sling load? Yes, yeah. all the time, all the time. Okay. Yeah, because you're always responsible. Well, you have want to know what's where it is. Yeah. You know, because you're always looking, and and you make it what you want to. You know, we bullshit all day long. I mean, the pilots they could cut in on you, mm -hmm. but I mean, your gunner and, and and your crew chief, you know, and everything like that. You know, you talk about you know, are you going to town tonight or something? How's your girlfriend doing, or whatever you know? That that was just life. That was life. And and the night we'd write letters home to our girlfriends and that. And my girlfriend, which is my wife for 53 years now, everybody in first flight wrote her. Mm -hmm. I love you, Mavis. Or all the time, you know. Everyone loved her, you know. And you know, everybody knew her, you know. You know. And, and same with the, like Don Carlson, he got a Dear John every other day. Every other day she wrote. And then we got home and we met up. And I said to him, I said, you going to marry that bitch? That sent you a DWI? Well, he did marry her, had a son, and then dumped her. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, and he got married again and his wife just died, else he would have came along down here with us. But uh, no, a lot of us, uh, you know, I I had prostate cancer and uh, a few other problems in my life, but health-wise, I'm pretty good shape. Yeah, okay. pretty good shape. All right. Now, if you kind of think over that year you spent in Vietnam, are there particular events or things that or impressions that stand out in your memory that you haven't talked about yet? No, no. I tell you what, I would do it over again tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And when 9-11 happened, if they would have rang my telephone number, I'd been gone. It was, I mean, you know, I'm a pretty patriotic person. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, but the deal is, like every war, if they would have let us go after them, we would have got them. And same went over there. What did we do? End up pulling out of there. Mm -hmm. Iraq and that. Yeah. Iran. Jesus. And we killed millions of them. We killed millions of them. How many, you know, do you think those statistics are right? You uh, know, we, yes, we know we lost 58,000 people. Yeah. But do you think the other statistics are right? No. Because when the napalm was laid down and, and nerve gas that we, we dumped out of them ships and all that stuff, how do you know? Well, the, I mean, the losses in Vietnam were, were, were enormous, and and, all, and the major in most wars, the majority of casualties in the end are civilians, you know. And, yeah. And that can happen, and yeah, and so forth. Yeah, yeah. The problem with that war, which is beyond the scope of this interview, is that if you made it a fully blown war, the Chinese would have gone in, and then you would have had, and they they told us they were going to do that. They were, and they would. They they did in Korea. They would have done it again. But the, here too, I gotta tell you that you know. We did bomb them for two days, mm -hmm. and it said if we were bombed the third day, they would have gave up. Well, they were, yeah, they didn't understand why, de why we, didn't, we didn't do more than we did. Yes, but they, they, all, yeah, they were ready to give up. Well, and that's what they say. Well, you know? they're, it's, it's a little, I mean, I'm the historian, it's a little more they, complicated than that, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, they, the, the, la that la the last round of bombing did help push them back to the negotiating table. Yeah. But, but in the larger scheme of things, uh, the Chinese 
were ready. They, if, you got, if, if the North Vietnamese had, had, had just made a deal right then, it's, that, that might have worked. Uh, anything much further, they would have been. But that's off. That's beyond the scope yes, of, of, I, of you know, your How story. do we know? How do we know? But I mean, we were flying many times in a non-flying zone, mm -hmm. and the NVA were walking across the middle of a field, and we could not take them. Yeah, that's many right. times. Yeah, many times, dressed in their black uniforms, and you go. What are we doing? Yeah, yeah. No, there were there were there were lots of interesting rules and yes. a lot of things that, that, that were certainly counterproductive. Uh, but okay, we're gonna just sort of just kind of circle back again to your your story. So um, you kind of laid out pretty well what your life was like and what it was that you were doing, and we talked a little bit about about. Yeah. So ripcord for you was that the worst place to go, or was there someplace worse? No, ripcord was the worst. Yeah, yeah, that was the worst of the worst. But I mean. Sure, it, there was bad places. Mm -hmm. You know, Hamburger Hill was over before we got there. Yeah. You know, so you know, you know, you see Hamburger Hill and you wonder. That's you know, you everybody saw the movie. You know, yeah. you go. Yeah, although that may have been worse for the infantry than, than for yeah. the helicopter guys, uh, but the nature of Ripcord with all the hills around it and all the places where they could have their machine guns, uh, and, and the number of them they had. Yes. Yeah. It was just it yeah, was crazy. It, but. I watched those films at night, you know, on the Ashaw Valley, mm -hmm. where where they could see light for 20 miles, you know, people carrying stuff down the Ashaw Valley, and then we go in there and bomb that, and the next day they had the roads cleared again, mm -hmm. you know, and I saw the movie. Uh, really, this is live. I saw not live, but I mean, true. Where them women were out there by the thousands, oh, yeah. Yeah. filling up holes. Sure, yeah. You know, I mean, that's dedication. It is dedication. Yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, now you said as you got short, as you got toward the end of the tour, so you were basically trying to avoid having your ship go through a major overhaul. That's right. So that's you found right. excuses to find ways. No, to fly no, it. no. I didn't find any excuses. I wanted to fly every day. Yeah. They didn't want to do the overhaul. Oh, oh, they didn't want to do it. No, okay. The, the company okay. didn't want to do so the they overhaul. Just had you doing the other no, missions? We, no, that was that wasn't that wasn't my either. priority. I would have rather been flying every hour of the hour. Mm -hmm. But when you get like I think I had five hundred and fifty five hours combat flying time or something like that, you know, and then you know, you just put that how many days in that but you gotta remember when it was when you're socked in, you know, no way flew. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So what did you do all day if you weren't flying? Pulled maintenance on the ships. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when you saw other helicopters, you'd go, I just cannot believe this, you know, oil all over them and stuff like that. Not in our flight platoon, mm -hmm. not in our flight. There was, there was no dripping of oil or anything like that. We took pride in that. Then they'd point, we had pachyderms, you know, we're the pachyderms, we had them on the front of our helicopters. Well, then they came down with this stupid deal that, oh, that, that wasn't, you know, Army issued, so they had, would paint them off there. Then we'd go back and paint them on there again. <laughs> and then they cut the next guy, I thought we took them off of there. Oh, no, you didn't take our mine off, you know. Then they'd repaint over them again. And then they used light paint, so when it rained, Paint came off, then the pachyderm was there again. <laughs> so then, after we couldn't do that, we painted our wheels. First flight painted wheels. Everybody had different color wheels. Well, when you fly by somebody, all you had to do is look at the wheels. You know who it was, you know. And then you, you know, give them the high five or whatever, you know, back and forth, back and forth. And uh, but if a helicopter got shot down, uh, a Chinook, mm -hmm. everybody went there, yeah. you know. Everybody, it was, you know, in, in our area, mm -hmm. went there to make sure that, you know, if it's burning and everything like that down there, you go, you know. yeah. Did you ever have to pull out a, a damaged uh, Chinook, like fly yours, to pick up another one? No, but I picked up many Hueys mm -hmm. and Cobras out of the jungle. Okay. But they had to blow the trees so I could get down. Right. So they could get on top, you know, they're always on top. And bring, yeah. But... The worst thing that I've ever seen in my life was the medevac. We had a medevac up there, 
And there was a Huey that I picked up, and I don't know, remember where I took it, but I took it to the junkyard, whatever, I'll yeah. say this. I've never in my life seen so many holes in a helicopter, and it was a red cross on there. Mm -hmm. If there was one hole in there, there was a thousand holes in there. And blood from one end to the other. And I just go, oh, geez, Lord, what in the heck? Why a Red Cross? Mm -hmm. You know, and I just, I, you know, things like that just don't register to me. Mm -hmm. If they, you know, you're trying to get your deal, we, we let you get your wounded out of there. Mm -hmm. Why would you not do it? But that, that's the worst I've ever seen something in my life, you know. And I just think if we would have had our, our telephones of the day then, yeah. everything would have been out in the open. Mm -hmm. Everything. Yeah. Because when you're out in the jungle, you can't take your box camera along and then, it, it, you know, it, the whole world's destroyed. And then if you mailed it home and never got home anyway, for your mother to, you know, to to uh, take send it in and get it, you know, because you you most pictures they look through every one of your pictures before you know after you had pictures taken, so you wouldn't get your pictures back. So, uh, but but just think of a cell phone of this day. Oh, oh yeah, well a cell phone could run the entire helicopter. You know the, the software would be good enough if it could do. All yeah, but things. I mean, but yeah, but yeah, there, oh, sure, you sure. know, yeah, we. Yeah. I I think. Maybe the second uh, V device I got, I was flying with this this one guy named Sweeney, and we're coming in this fire base, and a mortar round goes on underneath us, and they're taking incoming. So he pour, he threw smoke out, and we called in a gunship, and a gunship scraped the deal, and then there was some Australians down there. And they called us and said, hey, Chop, you know, good count. You got a big head count down here, and we got them, you know. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we didn't do shit. We got, we, yeah, we were standing there, we got, the, you know, mm -hmm. flying cross with the feet of ice on there. And I thought, well, that's what we're after, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, things like that just happened to us, you know. Okay. This tape is about up, so we're going to pause here. I'm going to rewind, reload, and... All right. Now, uh, another dimension of sort of life in the fire base, what you were talking about off camera a moment ago. Uh, so you had chaplains then at the base? Yes, yes. They came. They came quite often, quite often. And they used to record us, you know, and then send it to our churches, you know, mm -hmm. how you're doing there and everything like yeah. that. And uh, like, uh, there was quite a few people who attended. Yeah, yeah it was unbelievable. So they, they had to be some, some believers, you know. Well, I don't know. I mean, did, what did you get out of that? Because I mean, you went regularly. What? Did you go regularly or when you could? Whenever I could. Yeah. Whenever I could. And there was a group, you know, a group of us, but we weren't Bible people or anything no. like that, you know. But, you know, I grew up in a small community and church was very important yeah. to us, you know. Yeah. So you get a little bit of almost normal life there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, did they rotate who the chaplains were? So you I, got, I think they did. So you got different I, denominations yes, and that yes, kind of thing. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, it, we're all. It, when you went to church, it was every nomination there. You know? Yeah, yeah. We had, you know, it, they didn't say, "Well, the Lutherans have to come, or yeah, the Catholics yeah, yeah, have right. to come, or whatever." You know, we're having church. You know, then you'd go in, and it was short and sweet. You know, yeah. you know. You always, you know, God bless you when you're in your flight and everything like that. And it just made you feel a little bit more at home, you know. All right. Now, did you take an R&R &R while you were in Vietnam? Yes, I did. And yes, I did. I went to Hawaii. Okay. My father had a stroke. Mm -hmm. And I sent for my mother to come over and my fiancé. Mm-hmm. And we stayed at the officers' quarters in Hawaii. And I showed my first sergeant. I'd get letters, and I'd write. My mother wrote mm -hmm. me all the time, and sent me packages and mm -hmm. everything. And all my mother would always say is, "Your dad and I are fine." Mm -hmm. And then I'd get one from my relatives that'd say, "Boy, they almost lost your dad again," you know. 
So one night I went over to the first sergeant, brought a six pack, and went in his hooch, and I said, would you read these letters and tell me what's going on, you know? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, your mind gets screwed up when you're there, you know? And he said, Brian, if you want to go home, 48 hours, I'll have you home. And I said, well, I don't know what's, what's going on, you know? I said, well, just, we'll cool it. Then I, I made all those arrangements, and I met him there. And when I got off the bus, there my dad was, and my dad was a very strong man. Mm -hmm. And there he was standing, he had a stroke, and hands hanging there, like mm -hmm. coming up to me like this. And he was crying, and I probably was crying also. But I'm going to tell you, somebody would have laughed at him. I killed him right there. No, but I was, you know, but uh, we spent, I don't know what it was, three or four days together, and it was wonderful. And then he, he kept getting better. When I, by the time I got home again, he was, he was better. Okay. But, so that gave me the opportunity to, to uh, get a job in the Twin Cities. And then in 1975, he was down in the Twin Cities with me and my wife, staying at our apartment with my mom, and uh, he stroked out, mm -hmm. died at him, died there. Wow. And I'm the only son, so I had to go home and run a salvage yard for him. So I ran for 25 years. I went home, ran for 25 years. So. All right. Well, that jumps a little bit ahead in the story, but it was good to get that included. Mm -hmm. So you, you had your R&R &R, uh, and, and come back again, uh, and then... Um, you know, I couldn't even tell you what date it was. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, yeah. but, you know, I went on R&R. &R. Yeah. But, but uh, it must have been halfway through your... Yeah. Well, you got to some extent, you got to pick once you were there a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're on a base and so you can communicate with the people who make those arrangements, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not too hard. You know, and then finding a helicopter ride out to wherever the airport was going to be. That was, was you hard. know, when you were in flight platoon and everything like that, things like that were no problem. Yeah. You know, you could get anywhere you wanted to get, you know. And when you we were filling up like up at Evans and that, you had colonels and captains, full majors, where are you going, you know? Can we drop a ride? Yeah. You know, we'd take them all the time. I mean, here we're filling up a fuel. Yeah, we're going back, we'll get you, we'll get you over here, you know? Yeah. You know, they just wanted to get going, you sure. know? So. Uh, now, when you were flying some of these sling loads and things like that, or if you're particularly say if you're carrying, you know, a few, would you like a sling have like a fuel blivet below you sometimes if you're going to take that to a base? Yeah. yeah. Now, did those things ever get hit and shot up? Who knew? Oh. You never knew. Okay. So if a fuel blivet got hit, it didn't blow up or... No, it up. never blew up. No, they no. just sealed and... They sealed and, you know, you'd always think that, I think in their mind, in their mind, if they could get a trace around in there, yeah. they were going to blow you up. But that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. That wasn't true. Because I, like I said, the sheet metal men in that, they changed so many that they were pissed at me <laughs> all the time. And then they cut them open and give you, you know, yeah. they always find the shells, they always, uh, the, the bullets, you know. Yeah. They find it. Okay. All right. Uh, so now you, you get you get in, in December now, 1970, kind of time to go home. How do they get you home? Or do you got anything else you want to throw in here first? Well, I'm telling you what. There was no idea that we were going home. I wasn't supposed to go home till January or February. Okay. So then I went up that one night and on the board to see where I was flying, you know. Mm -hmm. And it said... Pouts and Carlson de rose in three days. So I took that off the wall, went down to the first sergeant again because he was a hell of a nice guy. Mm -hmm. So I walked into the first sergeant, he says, Come on in, Pouts, you know, you knew me by yeah. first yeah. name, oh, yeah. you know, not by first name, but by Pouts, you know. Yeah. And I said, What is this? He says, You're going home in three days. I said, I am not going home and have to polish boots mm -hmm. for three months. I said, I want to stay. He said, no, you can't. <laughs> I go, 
what do you mean I can't? I said, I'm not going to the States. And he says, no, he said, you're getting out of the Army. And I said, I've only been in 18 months. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, Nixon's pulling you out. Mm -hmm. I said, geez, I must be one mean son of a bitch. I <laughs> and I says, first off, I got some more questions. I says, honorable discharge? He says, yep. I says, well, then I'm ready to go home. Mm -hmm. So then Carlson, he was on a mountaintop with a flare drop. You know, we put, go on mountaintops, mm -hmm. and then if they'd get in a firefight, we'd fly around, we had big canisters, we'd throw through the ship mm -hmm. and light up the whole area. Right. right. So they could see and fight, you know. And he started up, his, made his pilot start a ship and come on back home. He almost got court martial for that. But we spent the next three days, we went to the went to the PX and got a couple cases of beer, sat in our chairs, sunglasses on, and they'd come by and say, we're so short, you know, you always drink a little beer, short, I'm so short that my hair hurts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but we all had to get haircuts and shaves and everything before we could leave, you know. Then this, uh, this, uh, our, uh, what was his name, Littleton? He was a jeep driver mm -hmm. of the company, and he took us around and we got rid of our, we carried 38s mm -hmm. and had to check them in and I had a grenade launcher and on, in the ship and had to turn all that and all your flight suits you had to turn in. And we packed up and away we went. We had no problem taking us up to the airport and getting us down to Tamron Bay. There was no problem, you know, we're flight yeah, boys. Yeah, yeah. We're flight boys, we're going home. And, Got to Cameron Bay and called your name and walked out there and got on the plane going home. That was as simple as it was, you know. Yeah. So where did you land in the States? Washington. You went, you went back to where you started from. Right where I started. Okay. And they discharged you right there? Right there. Okay. Then you got to go to Seattle mm -hmm. on an airplane and fly home. And now, did you fly in uniform or did you have civilian clothes? I flew in uniform. Okay. And did you have any problems? Yes. What happened? Yes. Baby killer, you know, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, there was no flights to Minnesota. So I said to the airline, I said, just put me on an airplane, head me to Minnesota. The next thing I knew, coming around on a bank, I look out the window and the Statue of Liberty is there. Oh. <laughs> Landed in New York. Landed and he said, We have a room for you and everything. I said, No. I said, Get me any connecting airplane that's heading me to Minnesota. So they checked, hooked me up, and I think I, I got close to Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I landed again. Then I called my cousin and I said, I got another plane and I'm going to be there at like one o'clock. I said, You be there and pick me up. Came in and I had to still stay on my uniform. Mm -hmm. But I came in, we landed, and all I could see in those days, you didn't, let, you know, there was no wings out or anything. Mm -hmm. They pushed that thing out and you got out the door and came yeah. down. I got out and I kissed that ground, and here came my cousin with two green belt beers coming across the flight line. And you talk about, you know, you try that today, you know. Yeah. Yeah. He came around there and we hugged and, you know, cried some more and, and drank that beer. And then I, uh, and was home, and I didn't tell no one except this guy here that I was coming home. So, so I surprised a lot of people. Okay. Knocked on the door of my mom. What are you doing here? <laughs> well, at least you knew what you looked like. Yep, yep, yep. But as soon as I, as soon as I got in Minneapolis, I started taking my stuff off. Mm -hmm. Started taking my stuff off because there was still people jacking it, you know, around mm -hmm. who you are and everything like that. And I told my cousin Ronnie, I said, bring me a pair of pants and a shirt, whatever you do, you know. Mm -hmm. So I just got out of uniform and, and back in my hometown, we had one person killed. He was a machine gun operator in the infantry. He was killed there. But else there is two only two combat people in my town. Mm -hmm. but. There's people that were there mm -hmm. 
but non-combat. Right. You know, all those, you know, but every year in parades, every year in parades, they ride the boys from Vietnam, yep. you know, yep. and not this guy. No. no. Yeah. Well, you know, by some people's definitions, you were still sort of rear area, or at least you got to sleep in the rear. Uh, which is a little different from combat infantry, but I think I think most of those guys they recognize that the helicopter guys were. I mean, they, they often think that what you did was more dangerous than what they did. Well, and sometimes maybe it was. The deal is, what did they say? You know, a gunner on a Huey life expectancy four minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, which must not be true. But, but I'm going to tell you what, I would have liked to have been there. Mm -hmm. You know, you know I. I was pretty gun ho and I, I could really I could really shoot, but yeah, yeah. you know, but you know, that doesn't do any good when there's a hundred of them shooting at you, you know. But I maybe would have been in country one day, you know. All right. Well you already covered a little bit what you did after you got back. So you yeah. went to, you went to work in Minneapolis for a yeah. while, but then you had to go back home and, and, yes, and, and take dad, over the shop. Yeah, my dad died in seventy five and I came, you know, I got married when I got home and and I said, you know, I, that was the plan, mm -hmm. you know, you know, and I never looked back, you know, and uh, I, I've been treated for a little anger management, and so has a lot of other people, mm -hmm. and and but, you know, being patriotic, you know, somebody screws around with the United States, I'm right there yet. I don't care if I'm 72 years old, mm -hmm. this jack that ain't gonna jack around with this guy. Yeah. I've known a few World War II vets who are ready to go back after 9-11. You know, Uncle Sam will take and they go. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, now, you mentioned you ran the, the salvage yard for 25 years, so they got you about down to 2,000 or so. Did you retire out of that or take a different job? No, I took a different job. Okay. 2,000. 2,000, the markets uh, went to crap. Mm -hmm. And there was no way you could pay your bills. So I went back to the Twin Cities on my original job. I was building outdoor advertising signs, okay. the, big, the big high ones, and I told them that I said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 15 years of my life if you take me back. I said, okay. They took back. In two weeks I was foreman already. Mm -hmm. And I worked there for 12 years and the company had made 37 million point six Thirty-seven point six million dollars. They froze my wages and took my bonus away, and I was sixty-two years old. I had twelve years in, mm -hmm. and I had five years in before. So I had seventeen years in, and I said, "Boys, I can't work for a company that doesn't respect the people that make the money for you." Mm -hmm. Walked out the door. Well, I had my union representative along. And my birthday is December 28th, so I'm sitting there with my representative at, with the bosses, and I said, uh, I'm going to, December 28th is my last day. Well, you get the week off before Christmas anyway, if you're union, you know, mm -hmm. and you get the first off, and you got to come back on the second. So my union representative says, no, he's not retiring on the December 28th. He's going to retire on January 2nd. So I said, hey, he's my union representative. So I came back for one day, mm -hmm. got on my crane, went out and craned all the stuff they needed up and everything like that. I came in, grabbed my toolbox, threw it on my pickup, and left. A week later, I got a payroll check for $5,600. They had to pay my all my Holidays and all oh, those else. unpaid vacations. That's time. why you're union. Yes, yeah, there are things to be said for union. Yep. And now this day and age, I get a, I get, I belong to the international union, and I belong to the local union yet, which is local ten, mm -hmm. where uh, we're sheet metal men. Yeah. But anyway, I get an international pension, and I get a, get a local pension, right. and my social security. So, all right. Uh, now you said already, yeah, this is, you know, you think of your military career, you, you, you go back and do it again. Uh, what do you think you took out of that, or how did being in the service affect you? How did it affect me? It, it really, it affected me that to show how the government was so screwed up. <laughs> yeah. That's what it, it taught me, you know, that you can't trust anything, you know, and 
that's why, you know, when it comes to Republican, Democrat, I'm pretty radical. You know, I'm a Trump man 100%. I'm sorry for that, but I am. And I could have told you that Trump was going to win when I went up to the polls when Trump was running and everybody that were young were lined up for miles to register. And I knew that something was there was a change because people were sick and tired of this. And they are sick and tired again. And it's going to, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. So, and Minnesota, you know, we were, uh, you know, we killed Floyd, you know, and, mm -hmm. and started the whole world up in arms again. But we have a governor that we'd love to see get out of there, but there's no way we're going to get him out of there because the Democrats, there's two and a half million people in the Twin Cities which are Democrats, and the rest of us are Republicans out in the small town, and there's only three million people, mm -hmm. 3.2 million people in Minnesota. So you can't beat them, see? Yeah. So it's already rules. Politics. It's the one. Yeah. Politics. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and there's, and you, and you saw, in a way, some of the uglier dimensions of what happens when a government gets itself into something it doesn't even always understand, which is sort of what Vietnam was. Well, just look at, uh, look at their, uh, look at the hippies. You know, did they, did, they put a kind of a stop to this, you know. They, they had a lot of power. You know, when they demonstrated in Washington and that, you know. Well, in the end, if, if it were just them, it wouldn't happen. You, you had a whole lot of other people who were not happy either. But that's a whole other can of worms. Uh, but in the meantime, I would just like to close this out by thanking you for taking the time to, to share your story. It's a great story, and I appreciate having you. <laughs> Thank All you. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much.